you, post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, I'd like to know why you've shut up like a clam ever since we had our soup. Oh, I didn't mean to, Patsy. I've been thinking. Oh, that's good. What about? Marriage. What? Why, Nick? Mm Mm-hmm. Marriage is the only way to solve a murder. Now for the case of the policymakers. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by a new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's a beautiful afternoon early in November, and along a section of deserted highway, an open car moves toward the hills in the distance. In the car are Harvey Craig, a candidate for the state senate in the coming elections, and Julia Prentice, his fiancée of a few weeks. Suddenly, another car comes from behind, swerves sharply to the right, and cuts them off. Harvey! Take it easy, Julia. Hey, you men, what's the idea? Turn your car around, mister. Well, I'll do nothing of the kind. Let me get at him, Tom. I'll show you. Wait a minute, Joe, no rough stuff. Are you kidding? This guy's a hit-and-run driver. A killer, maybe. What's that? We saw the whole thing, mister. That man was on the road, and you went right over him, and you kept on going. We, but we... Julia, be calm, please. But these men are saying that I know what they're saying, dear, and I'm going to let them prove it. We're going back. Mister, exactly the way you left him. Exactly the way you and Joe left him. Harvey. Now, don't worry, Julia. That man on the road's a friend of theirs, a co-partner. But when I get through with him... But he seems to be unconscious. Uh, I'll show you how unconscious he is. Come on, you get up. Get up, the act is over. Are you... What's the matter, Harvey? This man is dead. Oh, no. Well, mister, this ought to convince you he wasn't a friend of ours. You killed him. Cut it out, pal. That ain't gonna get you out of a manslaughter rap. You murdered him, and then you followed me from the city. What's the idea? Who, who's paying you to do this to me? Paying us? Huh. That's a laugh. Uh, what are you doing, Joe? Checking this guy for identification. Harvey, we can't let these men get away with this. There must be some way of... Hey, look at this, Tom. I found it in the dead guy's pocket. An insurance policy for 50 grand. Oh, I see. Hmm. Taken out by Frank Hudson. That must be the dead guy's name. Never mind that. Look and see who's the beneficiary. Yeah. It's Harvey Craig. What? What happened? He's the guy that's running for the state senate. Harvey, how does it happen that your name is on this? Hey, wait a minute. This guy's Harvey Craig. So that's the angle, huh? A murder frame-up. It's tough, Your Honor. Well, Junior, this is it. The end of a career. But why? You can prove that you don't know that man, that that Frank Hudson. Maybe, but but suppose I've been set up for the perfect rap. Look, bud, we're a couple of reasonable guys. You pay us the face value of that policy of 50 grand, and we destroy the policy and forget what we saw. Mm Mm-hmm. We uh, even make the corpse disappear. What do you say? Harvey, you're not going to do it. I'm afraid I am, Junia. Because if I don't, neither of us will live to tell the story. I see what you mean. Let's go back to town. I'll get the money. You go with him, Joe. Yeah. I'll stay here and take care of the body. That's the whole story, Nick. I paid them because I was afraid of what they might do to Julia and me. And because I wanted to get to your office as quickly as possible. Why didn't you go to the police, Harvey? I promised Julia I wouldn't. As a matter of fact, she doesn't even know I'm here. I don't understand it, Harvey. 
The girl you're engaged to doesn't want you to go to the police. I know it sounds odd, Patsy, but you and Nick have never met Julia. She's proud. She thinks I'm a sucker for having paid off. And she thinks the less I talk about it to anyone, the better. So you want us to keep mum? Yes, please. Why didn't you raise your voice when you got back to town? I was afraid of the bad publicity, Nick. A murder charge. Harvey, they wouldn't have dared to make it against you. Oh, I... I wasn't thinking at the time. Oh, Nick, I want you to get them, will you? Of course he will, Harvey. Well, I guess that settles that. I've been put to work. Oh, thanks, Nick. Oh, here's a description of Joe and Tom. I've written it down. Oh, good for you. Every little thing helps. Well, I've got to go now. Uh, I'll be at my campaign headquarters, Nick, if you should want me. Goodbye and good luck. Oh, poor Harvey. Well, Nick, what do you think? I think this has all the earmarks of a murder racket for blackmail. Wonder whom it's happened to before. Then you don't think this was the first time? Oh, it couldn't be. Gang that operates so smoothly must have had a lot of experience. But where do they get the victims? Well, if Harvey's typical, I'd say from who's who. No, no, Patsy. I mean the victims they kill. Harvey told us he never saw that Frank Hudson before. Yet that man had a policy naming Harvey as the beneficiary. Well, it could have been a phony. Well, it could have been. But suppose it wasn't. Who set Hudson up for it? And how? Boy, ah. Uh, Patsy, do you have any old clothes? Any very old clothes? Would you mind telling me what old... Not at all. I've got an idea that somewhere in the slums or along the waterfront, there are operators pulling hopeless prospects out of the gutter. Oh. And setting them up for the kill. Well, you and I are going to be a couple of prospects. <laughs> Longer, Nick. We've been to every waterfront dive in town. Oh, Patsy. Two whole weeks of living in rags. Well, that's the detective business. Oh, go into your rags. We're being watched. Oh, well, why did I ever marry you? You were going to buy me a swell house and fur coats. I was going to be a grand lady. Well, it's not my fault my plans didn't work out. All I need is one real break. One real break. That's what I've been hearing for years. Well, I wish you'd break your neck. Oh, fuck. Lay off, will you? Oh, why did I ever marry you? No place to live, no decent clothes to wear. You never even had a job. Well, maybe you think jobs grow on trees. <laughs> maybe they do, mister. Oh, uh, hey, what do you want? Tom's name. They're in trouble, pal. It's none of your business. You wouldn't talk so loud, I little. couldn't help it, Henry. I'm so, so fed up. Yeah, she's got a right to be. She's hungry. She's got no place to live. Why don't you go take a walk? Maybe I got a job for you, Henry. What? You. For you too, baby, but don't count on it. I'm only the outside guy. I got a boss. What kind of work will this be? Uh, depends. Interested? Oh, yes. How about Mabel? I don't, don't even care know what... what it is, Henry. You're going to work if it kills you. Let's go, Mr. Tom. <laughs> You've been married for six years, and you've done some traveling. The hobo trail, Mr. Nicholas? Uh, sometimes. Mm-hmm. Any man who would subject a woman to such a life... Well, I couldn't help it, Mr. Bentley. The brakes were all against me. How did you feel about that, Mrs. Nicholas? Oh, I couldn't leave Henry. Ah, uh, such devotion. Well, I need a couple in my house. Naturally, you've never been a butler, Mr. Nicholas. No. Uh, no, sir. Uh, no, sir. That's better. I see you learn quickly. You'll keep this place in order, and you'll see that it's dusted. Yes, sir. And now, Mrs. Nicholas, can you cook? Sure. Uh, I mean, yes, sir, Mr. Bentley. Good. My tastes are very simple. We'll get along. Uh, Tom. Yeah? Uh, these people are going to stay in the room on the fourth floor. Okay. Ask Joe to prepare it for them. Okay, Mr. Bentley. Uh, do we go with him? Uh, no, no. You wait here. Uh, if you're wondering about my two men, Tom and Joe, they live here with me. I prefer them to dogs. No, we weren't wondering, Mr. Bentley. Good. You'll make the ideal butler. Now, there's one matter that must be settled before we begin our <laughs> relationship. Yeah? As you see, I have many valuables in this house. Rare paintings... Antique vases, so forth. Oh, you don't think we'd steal from you, Mr. Bentley. It's happened before, my dear lady. And so I have one strict policy in this establishment. 
All my employees must be bonded. Ah, I see. Do you object, Mr. Nicholas? Oh, no, no, no. It's all right with me, uh, sir. Yes. I'll have the forms here sometime tomorrow morning. In the meantime... Excuse me, Mr. Friendly. What is it, Tom? Uh, Joe's on his way up to the room. You want me to show him where to go? Oh, they'll find it. The fourth floor, Mr. Nicholas. Then turn to the left. Yes, sir. Come along, Mabel. Yes, sir. I uh, didn't do so bad, did I, Mr. Bentley? Two instead of one. Yeah. Why don't we give him the insurance business? We don't know anything about them, Tom. A couple of hard luck bombs, that's all. I wonder. The lady had clean fingernails. <laughs> I don't get it. What surety company would bond a derelict or a couple of derelicts? Patsy, we're not going to be bonded. But Mr. Bentley said... Only a gag with a last-minute switch. Oh, from bonding to insurance? Uh Uh-huh. Then when Mr. Bentley starts talking about insurance... Yes, Patsy. I think I'll let some air into this room. But, Nick, in the Frank Hudson policy Harvey told us about, Bentley wasn't the beneficiary. You're not on your toes tonight, Patsy. Well, I'm only trying to put myself in the place of an intended victim. Don't try. You're right in it. But I'd become suspicious of a policy that didn't make Bentley the beneficiary. That's no use. Window's sealed shut. It's what? Sealed. It's glass barrier to the outside. But why? Just in case someone should want to yell for help. Oh. Does that answer your questions about the policy? You mean the victims were forced? They were if they became suspicious of Bentley. But as long as they believed in him as a good Samaritan who could do no wrong... Even when he made someone else the beneficiary? Even then. Remember, the people who signed those policies were hungry, down and out. Oh. Bentley was giving them... Uh-uh. May we come in? Of course. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. You stay here at the door, Tom. Okay. You, Joe? Yeah, all right, Mr. Bentley. Well, my dear Mr. and Mrs. Nicholas, don't look so surprised. It's an old custom of mine when I'm welcoming new servants. I've uh, brought a bottle of wine. For us? For me, too. A rare, sparkling burgundy. I want you to feel at home. Uh, Permit me to do the honors. For you, Mrs. Nicholas. Thank you, sir. For you, Mr. Nicholas. And now, one for me. Raise your glasses, please. A toast. To my new servants, Mr. and Mrs. Nicholas, better known as Nick Carter. Did I startle you, Miss Bowen? What? How did you find out about us? Oh, my underground espionage system. I see. Well, what are you going to do with us now? Kill you both, of course. Oh. But not until I've made arrangements to convert you into cash. And that, my friends, will be very soon. So, Bentley has found out Nick and Patsy, and behind him are two men with guns. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the policymakers. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by a new post-war Old Dutch Glanter. It is several hours later, and in Bentley's luxurious library, Nick and Patsy are sitting near the desk, surrounded by Tom, Joe, and Bentley. <laughs> Here's the forms, Mr. Bentley. All filled out and ready for the signature. Well, oh, thank you, Tom. Give Mr. Carter his. Your application for insurance, Mr. Carter. You're asking for a quarter of a million. Don't you rate me too high, Bentley? Oh, no, not too high for a man of your reputation and uh, connections. Here's your application, sister. Yes. Forgive us, Miss Bowen, but we think you're worth only a hundred thousand dollars. I'm not worth anything to you. You let me be the judge of that, won't you? Well, so Jackson Phillips is going to be my beneficiary. Why not? He's our city's leading banker. Now, Miss Bowen, your beneficiary is Mortimer Evans, the department store owner. He knows you quite well, personally, and by your extensive charge account. It won't do you a bit of good, Bentley. We'll see. Please sign these applications. 
You're not going to send our friends up for blackmail? Those were very harsh words, Mr. Carter. Let me go to work on them, Mr. Bentley. Oh, Joe, Joe, you're much too temperamental. But it's no dice if we don't get their signatures. This ain't like the other jobs we've done. We're shooting for big dough now. We got to have their signatures in their own handwriting. We'll have them, Joe, but without your methods. What's wrong with my methods? Oh, they're much too crude for present company. Oh. I'm sure that Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen will prefer my more scientific methods of persuasion. This darn room. It's like a vault. Top floor vault. They were going to torture us, Nick, if we hadn't signed. Listen, Patsy, I'll let you in on a secret. What? I knew all the time we were going to sign those applications. You did? Of course. We had to sign them to get the goods on Bentley and his gang. No case without them. Oh, I see that now, Nick. Let's see. Two o'clock. Time to get out of this room and down to the library safe. Oh, that's going to be easy. What with that window sealed and with Joe parked in the hall just outside. It can be done. Bentley and Tom ought to be asleep by now. Well, suppose they are. We still can't get out. Take off your shoe. What? Your shoe. Take it off. We've got a job for it. All right. <clears throat> now what do I do? Hobble around? Smack the heel of your shoe against that window pane and break it. Ah, now look, Nick. I'd like to get some air, too, Go but... ahead now. I'm going to plant myself behind this door. On that chair you've got there? No, under it. Ready to bring it down on Joe's head. Okay, Go ahead. Um, fun. Hey, what's the idea of breaking it? Oh! Well, Patsy, see what I mean? Oh, you're full of tricks tonight, aren't you? Full of them. Now let's get down to the library and take out some reading matter. get it open? I don't know. It's been a long time since I opened a safe without knowing the combination. Well, have you got enough light? Yeah. It's a lucky thing we found this flashlight in Bentley's desk drawer. And look at the size of it. Why, it must be ten inches long. And it weighs close to... <gasps> there goes the bolt. Oh. Now for some quick research. You need help? Yeah, just bring the light closer. Yeah. Uh, look, Patsy. Policy blanks. A stack of them. Mr. Bentley had plans for a future, didn't he? Hmm. Let's see what's in this drawer. Are they there, Nick? The applications we signed? Hmm. Uh, yes, here they are. Good. Now, we'll make a bundle of all this evidence and then lock up the safe, just in case. Oh, we're not going back upstairs, Nick. Of course not. We're phoning the police. Oh, that's much better. Nick. Yes, quiet. Someone's walking outside in the hall. You didn't close the door, Patsy. Oh, I forgot. They've seen the flashlight. Oh, they won't see us. Let's get behind them. Be quiet. <laughs> she fell down. Turn on the flash. <gasps> Take a look. That's Harvey Craig. Yes. Well, what's he doing in this house? He just died. Oh. Murdered. Unless I don't know what I'm talking about. Oh. Don't you see it, Patsy? See what? This whole dirty business. How did Harvey Creed get to this house? Who brought him? Someone turned the lights on. So, you finally figured it out, Mr. Nick Carter. What? Who's she? You're Julia Prentice, aren't you? Yes. I brought Harvey here. He shouldn't have told you what happened to us on the road. You, you killed him? <laughs> we had some wine, honey. Harvey's glass had poison in it. Oh. Stay where you are, Carter. Mr. Bentley wouldn't like me to shoot you. All right, Julia. You've got the heavy artillery. And to think Harvey considered her a friend. So many people do. Men particularly, huh? Men with a lot of money. Yes. You're Bentley's contact woman. You set up the blackmail victim, and then you're in the car with him when the so-called hit and run takes place. Of course. Uh, the right place and the right time are very important in our business. How did you know we were in this house? We didn't see you. Uh, I saw you, Miss Bowen. And I recognized Mr. Carter from his newspaper picture. Uh, a peephole in the wall of your room upstairs, Mrs. Nicholas. Oh, Nick, we never had a chance. Let's say you might have had one if you didn't have clean fingernails. Clean fingernails? A bad habit, Miss Bowen, when your life depends on it. 
Bentley phoned me in town. I came, I saw, and I couldn't believe my eyes. Well, what happens now, Julia? There's a little room in the cellar I'd like to have you see. Oh? It's not much of a room, but it's escape-proof. And we want so much to see you again tomorrow. Uh, that is when we'll need you. <laughs> What time is it, Nick? My watch isn't as luminous as it used to be, but I should say it was about a quarter past one. Day, night, or eternity? Afternoon, Patsy. Hey, you're not losing your nerve, are you? I... uh, I never felt better in my life. (laughs) I'll bet. Well, turn on your flashlight and you'll see. After all, we've only been down here since last night. Well, why don't you turn it on? Can't. Battery's dead. Afraid so. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Listen, Nick, Patsy. we'll never see daylight again. They'll kill us before they take us out of here. No, they won't. They can't. But they will. No, Patsy, we've got to appear to be accident victims. <laughs> they can't run a car over us here. Huh? They've got to take us out of the house. And once we're out in the open... Oh. Yeah, this may be a fancy. Now, listen, don't fight them. We don't want them to carry us out. You go first, Tom, um, with the lantern. Right, Miss Bentley. You next, Joe. And don't lower your gun. Uh, not with him around, boss. Ah, oh, good afternoon, Mr. Carter, Miss Bowen. Julia told me you were very naughty last night. Oh, I hope we didn't put you to any inconvenience. We make the punishment fit the crime. Come here, Miss Bowen. I like it where I am. Ah, me. We're going to have trouble. Julia has an appointment to go driving this afternoon with Mortimer Evans, your beneficiary. You've got to be on the road, Miss Bowen. Oh, Nick. His turn will come later another day. We can't do everything at once, you know. Listen, Bentley, you take both of us or you don't take either of us. Very gallant, Mr. Carter. Uh, Tom, uh, take Miss Bowen outside. Okay. No, you don't. Get him off me. Get him off. Joe, you heard what Tom said. I'll get him off. Nick. Nick. That tap with my gun makes me even for last night. Come along, Miss Bowen. You killed him. Let me go. Nick. Nick. No, no, my dear. It won't do you a bit of good to struggle. Julia has an appointment. And you must help her keep it. for the conclusion of the case of the policymakers. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. It's ten minutes later. Patsy fainted and is lying on the sofa in the living room of Bentley's house. Nearby, Bentley and Julia are discussing their plans with Tom and Joe over a road map which is on the table. Now, this is the exact point in the road where you're to be. Uh, can't we use the same road for a change, Mr. Bentley? Listen to Julia, Joe, and don't ask so many questions. Uh, Mortimer Evans and I will pass that point about half past three. Now, what time do you have? Uh, I've got one thirty-five. Uh, me too. We agree. Well, Lucius, I'm ready to leave for town. I told Mortimer I'd meet him at two o'clock. I'm going to be late. Oh, not too late, my dear. Ten or fifteen minutes for one as charming as you. Can it, brother? The only thing I see in you is a bookkeeping item. Frank, Aunt Joe. Joe, Hmm? uh, get my car out of the garage. Yes, sure, right away. Give me a cigarette, Lucius. There are times, Julia, when you behave as if you're running this show. I might as well be. You couldn't get along without me. There are other women as well qualified. That's going to cost you 15% more, darling. What? Another bookkeeping item. I was going to talk to you about that later, but since you brought it up... No, look here, I want 45% from now on. You can have the 25% I've been getting. Now, wait a minute. There's no use arguing. I tell you that... Crazy, why, I... Am I interrupting something? (laughs) Nick Carter. He's got a gun. Falling out among thieves, huh? Well, you won't have to worry about percentages anymore. Or maybe you should worry about the percentages. Because from now on, they're all against you. Operator... Give me police headquarters. Nick, how did you do it? Patsy, as I came up from the cellar, there was Joe walking toward the front door. He went out like a light. Of course, I had to hit him first. Oh, that's not what I mean, Nick. Then I took his gun and made the grand entrance. Uh, 
They were no, lying... no, no, you don't understand. I mean, how did you get out of that cellar room? It was simple. I took the door off its hinges. What? With Bentley's flashlight. You mean you used that flashlight to unhinge the door? Mm-hmm. It was heavy enough to drive the pins out of the hinges very neatly. Why, but I didn't hear... Of course it. not. I muffled the noise with my coat. Uh, oh, honest, Nick. When I saw you on the floor, unconscious, I thought... Oh, I wasn't unconscious. Oh, no. This is too much. Oh, no, Joe telegraphed that wallop. I saw it coming and I rode with it. The gun caught me in the back of the neck. That's why you're driving the car. Why, I'm... <laughs> All right, Nick. I'm listening. Oh, there's no mystery to it, Patsy. I've just got a good stiff pain in the neck. That's all. Can you tell us something about the story new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week, Nick? Well, Bob, next week we're going to meet a young contractor who helped us track a killer by trying to build a garage on an imaginary street. And Nick found the killer by listening to a talking typewriter. A talking typewriter? Imaginary streets? It sounds fascinating. Uh, what do you call the story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Missing Street. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Stedman Coles. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.